Hi, I'm Jörg Graf uh, from the University of Connecticut. Uh, I'm a microbiologist and I study microbiomes in different uh, animal systems and also in uh, the built environment of the aquaculture. And today I will be talking to you about insights into aquatic biofilm dynamics by high throughput identification of bacterial isolates and full length 16S RNA gene surveys. <clears throat> um, what you see here on this slide is uh, uh, it's a raceway of a commercial trout farm, and where the arrow is pointing is where, you, where there's a biofilm, and you can see a fluorescent in situ hybridization image of one of such biofilms. And we're interested in studying these biofilms <clears throat> because uh, they harbor patho fish pathogenic bacteria. So specifically, flavobacteria are important uh, pathogens in the aquaculture setting. Flavobacterium columnare and Flavobacterium psychrophyllum cause major disease outbreaks in aquaculture facilities worldwide. And in some locations, like the one that we visit, uh, these uh, infections reoccur on an annual basis and they lead to very high mortality. And so it is really important to figure out where these pathogens coming from, where are they hiding, and are there ways that we can prevent these reoccurring infections without having to resort to adding antibiotics. The potential reservoirs for these bacteria include the biofilms that form on the surfaces, either in the pipes or in the raceways themselves. They can also uh, result from having infected fish come into um, the raceways, and then they serve as a point, so a point source, and they spread rapidly uh, to the other fish in these dense environments. And so understanding the di dynamics of biofilm development is really important uh, to figure out how to prevent these diseases and provide new uh, intervention opportunities. <clears throat> and so the goals of our project are uh, to, uh, to study these reoccurring Flavobacterium columnare and Flavobacterium psychophyllum infections that occur in these, this farm in, in Buell, Idaho, especially inside a hatch house where the young fish uh, that are most susceptible uh, are living and grown, and to determine uh, the role of these biofilms in these reoccurring infections. And we are also interested in culturing autochthonous bacteria, so bacteria from the same source that can inhibit the growth of Flavobacterium columnare and Flavobacterium psychophyllum, so that perhaps we can end up using them as a probiotic to stop these infections. Uh, this is our sampling site. <clears throat> uh, uh, it's the Snake River in Idaho. And uh, one place that we visit is uh, the source of the water that goes to the farm, which is uh, a canyon. And then within the ca from the canyon, the water gets pumped uh, to the farm. And there are these biofilms that you can see forming on the rocks in the, in the creek in this canyon. And we, all, we took samples from those biofilms. Then this uh, water enters the hatch house uh, where the uh, fry uh, and, and the young fish are grown up until they can be transferred uh, to the adult raceways. And here you see a picture also of Ta Testerman, a graduate student in my lab, who was instrumental in performing this work. And then and these are what the adult raceways look like. And uh, I want, want to go over the standard uh, procedures that we use uh, in this study. And one of them is the, the standard uh, V4 processing workflow. And in the, on the left-hand side, we begin uh, with a sampling method. So we can either collect the uh, swabs from surfaces by using uh, sterile swabs, uh, or we can also uh, get samples from uh, the fish, dissecting them and, or taking swabs of them. We also filter the water. We use a two micrometer pre-filter that's shown on the bottom right in the left panel. Or we can also use, and we then subsequently use a Sterivex filter that is a 0.2 micron filter. For each sample, we filtered about six liters of water. From those samples, we then use uh, a DNA extraction kit uh, that we can uh, automate using a Kaya cube. Uh, it's a bead-based approach. And after isolating and quantifying the DNA, we PCR amplify, in this case, the V4 region of the 16S RNA in triplicate. Then uh, we process these samples further, we pool them, clean them up, and sequence them on an Illumina MySeq. And then the data analysis is done uh, using Chime2 and Data2. We also use full-length 16S RNA 
the sample processing, and here's the workflow for that. For this, we used either samples from fish or also swabs. And we're using a, a commercially available kit from a company called Shoreline Biome. That's a startup company in Connecticut where we're located. And uh, we used the DNA extraction kit. And after that, uh, we used the DNA uh, PCR amplification kit for the V1 through V9 region of the 16S RNA. And then we uh, sequenced it on a, a SQL, from PAC, SQL 2 from PacBio. The SQL 2 gives us a lot more throughput uh, than the SQL does. We then used the company's uh, initial program for analysis, the program for analysis, uh, SB Analyzer, and their database, Athena. And after that, we switched over to uh, Data2 and also Chime2 for the subsequent data analysis. <clears throat> and here's a, an example uh, of how we uh, provide the information. Uh, this is an image of a raceway, and then you have a pie chart that shows you the microbial, the composition of the microbial community of a baffle swab. Baffles are the, uh, the white inserts that slow down the flow rate of the water. And you can see in blue would be alpha proteobacteria, so the area of that pie chart uh, corresponds to the relative abundance of alpha proteobacteria in blue of bacteroidea, and then uh, in, 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 in orange of bacteroidea, and then in gray of gamma proteobacteria. And so you kind of can get a sense of the composition of the microbial community in these raceways. And so the water entering is shown then here on the left-hand side, on the top, uh, the pie chart shows you what's in the pre-filter, caught by the pre-filter, and then on the bottom you show what's basically planktonic, so these are 0 0.2 micron captured microorganisms. And you can see that uh, there are these uh, oxophotobacteria that are present in the, on the pre-filter that are then basically absent uh, on the, in the planktonic sample, showing you that there are different communities depending on the size that you sample. Uh, we can then also look at the entire community that is present on the surfaces. So these would be biofilm samples. And you can see that the distribution of the colors is very different uh, in, the, in the pie charts in the center. They're dominated by blue. So that would be alpha proteobacteria and then also bacteroidea and gamma proteobacteria. So those are the most abundant taxa in here. And what we're now interested in doing is trying to see how does the microbial community in these biofilms on the surface walls change as the fish in, the, in these raceways age. And so we're going to now focus on studying these uh, wall swabs. And for this, uh, Todd and I collected a whole series of wall swabs from raceways that contain very young fish uh, and then also uh, older fish. And we're depicting these data here on an NMDS plot. On NMDS plots, when two, each dot represents the microbial community, when two dots are close together, uh, these communities are very similar to each other. And when they're far apart, they're very dis different from each other using the Bray Curtis distance matrix measure. Uh, on the left hand side in blue, uh, these are uh, microbiome samples from the wall of. Um, raceways harboring very young fish, and you see an image of those little fish uh, fry uh, on the top of that. And they all cluster very close together. And uh, the circle around them shows you the confidence interval. Um, so they form one distinct uh, community structure. Then in the middle in green, we have uh, <clears throat> young fish. So these are a little bit bigger, as you can see. They actually look much more like a real fish. and uh, on the far right, in red, we have then what we call the mature or the older fish that are ready to be moved out to the adult raceways. And each age group has uh, clusters very nicely, and uh, they form a statistically significant distinct microbial community. And so you can see that uh, as the biofilm ages, or the fish age in the uh, raceway, and the, bio the walls are not cleaned in between, and so the microbial community changes in composition. Uh, we can now take a look uh, to a closer look at these microbial communities and see uh, how the composition uh, 
what the composition is like. And for that, we use bar graphs where uh, each color represents a different taxon. And then the height of the color within a bar graph shows you the relative abundance. I begin on the left-hand side here showing you uh, what the community composition looks like in a raceway that contains the youngest fish. And <clears throat> you can see how uh, these two uh, green uh, bars actually represent two different uh, taxa. One of them is the Poluchio boca, and the other one is Pseudomonas. And uh, please remember Pseudomonas uh, later on in the talk, or we'll, uh, it will come back. So you can see that in the young raceways, Pseudomonas is actually pretty abundant of the youngest fish. And then when we look at the raceways containing the younger fish, which now shows up, you can, the Pseudomonas is sometimes present, but usually it's not as abundant. It's really a taxon uh, that is mostly found in the raceways of the youngest fish. But uh, Hydrangeophaga and also Novo Spingium, for example, have increased in the relative abundance. So you begin to see a shift in the microbial community you also see that the different, the number of different colors has increased. And this shows us that the micro, complexity of the microbial community is increasing. And the same is true when we uh, move on uh, to the adult raceways, which is now shown on the far right. And you have different taxa that begin to increase in abundance that were less abundant in the earlier stages. So we do a maturation of the microbial community. <clears throat> we can also then begin to compare this uh, data by uh, using full length versus before sequencing. And on these, the next series of bar graphs, you will see the full length sequences first and then followed by the before sequences. And what we observed is that we got uh, quite a different uh, distribution depending on uh, which sequencing approach we use. And this also holds up when we look at uh, more samples. So here you see the youngest uh, microbial communities. You can see that the, fir uh, that the first bar is very different than the second bar, and this pattern continues. <clears throat> and this is now when we look at a whole subset. And we think that these differences are due to two different things. Uh, it has been shown by other people that depending on which uh, primers you use for uh, amplifying the 16S RNA, you introduce different primer biases. And so this will then lead to the differential amplification uh, of some taxa over other taxa. So one cannot really compare uh, microbial communities from a B4 region to a B1 to B3 region or a full length region simply due to the primer bias. And another thing is that we use the different DNA extraction uh, that is not a bead base, but a, but a, a different lysis approach base that is actually very good at also lysing gram-positive bacteria and spores. And so you could introduce a bias that way. And so while we get different community structures, I want to point out um, the differences that we can see uh, using the full length in, in contrast to the V4 sequences. And this is shown when we focus on this one uh, group of bacteria right here, the Rhodobacteraceae. And in the bar graph on the left-hand side, you see how many different sequences or sequence variants we get returned by doing the B4 region. It's about 200, while we get over 1,000 uh, amplified sequence variants went back when we do the full-length 16S sequences. So we get a much more fine-tuned insight into the microbial community when we can use full length sequencing. And this might allow us to discover new patterns and identify species that we could not otherwise identify. <clears throat> we were also able to detect uh, Flavobacterium columnare reads, and we could quantify them and then determine that in the youngest and young raceways, very few of the samples were actually positive. So in the youngest, only one out of eight was positive. And in the young, three out of 18 were positive. And they contained very low numbers of Flavobacterium columnare reads when normalized to 10,000 reads 
and that would be less than one. When we looked at the mature raceways, uh, we saw that 10 out of 12 were positive, and the count had increased to 3.5. So it looks like as the biofilm in the raceway matures, you also get colonization by pathogenic flavobacteria. And in the diseased, uh, in, a, in, a, in a raceway with diseased fish, uh, you could actually see that all of the samples were positive and the count was even higher, even though the causative agent that they identified was not a flavobacterium. So how can we now begin to control the presence and abundance of these uh, pathogenic flavobacteria in these raceways without having to resort to an added antibiotics? So our idea was to culture bacteria from this local environment and then see if we can identify some bacteria that might be able to inhibit the growth of pathogenic bacteria. So it's basically a probiotic for the built environment. Uh, so we uh, collected uh, swab samples from biofilms, uh, either in the raceway or in the canyon where the water is coming from, and uh, plated them on different types of media, uh, trying to, including uh, media that have been shown to allow the growth of many aquatic bacteria and also a low nutrient media. And on this plate, you can see all the different colors and all of the different sizes of the bacteria that we could grow uh, on this raceway, from this raceway wall. <clears throat> the approach then would be to take swabs. Uh, we uh, swab the plate, uh, the, uh, put the swab then on an agar plate and cover the whole area. We then do a dilution of that, and we incubate them either at 15 degrees or 25 degrees. <clears throat> Then after the bacteria have grown up, uh, we streak them for isolation, and then we will subculture those again to get pure cultures, and those are uh, stored and frozen at minus 80 degrees for further use. Because some of these bacteria grow up very slowly, we actually kept them in, a, in an incubator for several weeks and checking them regularly and isolating more and more colonies, trying to get the slow-growing bacteria as well. The next step <clears throat> then is uh, to, to freeze them away, and we got over 900 different isolates that we wanted to study further. And then the next aspect was to see if any of these would then inhibit the growth of pathogenic bacteria. And so we inoculated the bacteria in these 96 well deep well plates. And from those plates, uh, we would then, uh, in these plates, we would grow up the bacteria until we had uh, a nice uh, culture, and that would be either one or two days at 19 degrees. And uh, we would prepare uh, these large uh, agar plates on which we would spread one of these four pathogens, so Flavobacterium columnare, Flavobacterium psychophyllum, Vicinia rackeri, or Aramonis salmonicida, which are all uh, common fish pathogens. And then using an EP motion, we would spot uh, bacteria onto uh, these lawns that would form. And so we would take a 196 well plate and spot 48 of those isolates on one plate and the other 48 on a different plate so that we get nicer spatial separation. <clears throat> and then you let them grow up and uh, you look for zones of inhibition. And here you see now an image of one of these agar plates after 48 hours. And you see a light gray film. And that is actually the uh, flavobacterium that's growing up uh, on the agar plate. And then the different colored circles in the center are these colonies uh, that formed <clears throat> uh, where we had spotted uh, the different cultures that we had collected in at the trout farm. And now the goal is to look for zones of inhibition. And so take a look at this plate and try to see if you can detect the zones of inhibition and, and how many do you actually see. So the most obvious one is down here in the right-hand corner, now circled with yellow. There is one that formed a really large zone of inhibition. And so the bacteria that formed this colony seem to secrete a compound uh, that is able to kill off this flavobacterium. But there are actually two more zones of inhibition that you can pick up. 
and you see them now circled in the yellow circle right there. <clears throat> and so here you have on this one plate out of these 48 strains, we got uh, three different isolates that are inhibit the growth, able to inhibit the growth of Flavobacterium columnarum. <clears throat> And so of the 562 isolates that we screened, we found a 35 isolates that inhibited at least one pathogen. So that's basically 6% of the pathogens uh, inhibit, 6% uh, of the isolates that we screened inhibited at least one of these pathogens. Uh, 18 out of the 35 actually inhibited two or more pathogens and five of them three pathogens. And so we have now, uh, a collection of strains that we would like to analyze further. And the first thing is we want to identify what these bacteria are. And for that, we return to the shoreline biome B, uh, B1 through B9 kit. We used it for the DNA extractions uh, using the DNA prep in 96 well format. So we, when we grew them up, we could go straight from the 96 well plate that we grew them up in uh, to the DNA prep plate. After isolating the DNA, we would then put it on the barcoded PCR plate. And then we had six different plates, but they all have the same 96 barcodes. And so what we did is uh, we used six different smart bells that had different barcodes. And that was done <clears throat> at the University of Maryland for us at their sequencing center. And so they prepared the six different uh, smart bells that gave us then six different barcodes, one unique barcode for each uh, PCR plate. They were all pooled, and then they were sequenced on a single uh, SQL2 run. Uh, we got the data back, and uh, we got millions of reads back. And then uh, if you now look how many reads we got for each uh, of the smart bells and for each of the samples, we got over 4,000 reads for each one of our 96 samples. And so this gives us a really deep insight into the 16S sequences that we get from there. And so we could have actually multiplexed, uh, you know, gone to 12 plates, for example. Uh, so we have a very good depth. It also allows us to detect contamination, or if we have two isolates in one plate. Um, we identified them by using the uh, SB analyzer and data two. And after that, the ASBs were incorporated into CHIME 2, and there we used the green gene reference uh, data set initially uh, to identify them. And then more recently, we used the Silva and database, and that actually gave us a more detailed, higher resolution identification. And so then for each genus, we uh, took all of the sequence ASBs that we got back and all of the 16S RNA sequences of the type strains and constructed phylogenetic trees so that we could take a closer look uh, at the phylogenetic relationships and the identification. Uh, here's the overall taxonomic breakdown. So we cultured bacteria belonging to 22 different families and 48 different genera. The most common genera included Pseudomonas, Eremonas, Flavobacterium, and Acinetobacter. And the, most, the, is, uh, the isolates that inhibited the bacteria, most of them actually belong to Pseudomonas. And so if you think back now to the earlier slide where I showed you the changes in the microbial community um, of the raceway as the fish grew, the young, the biofilms in the raceways containing the youngest fish actually had the most number of flavor uh, uh, of pseudomonas. And then later on, they were less abundant. So these pseudomonads seem to produce antibiotics, <clears throat> uh, but they're not that abundant uh, in the older biofilms. Uh, <clears throat> here you can now see, I'm gonna show you a couple of phylogenetic trees and I begin with the zoom in to kind of uh, explain it to you a little bit. And so in the center, you see the phylogenetic tree. In blue are the type strains, and in red are the ASBs that you, we found. And they actually represent most likely novel species because they're quite different uh, from the known type strains. And then when you go to the uh, outer circles, the red color and the blue color there, again, indicate an ASV versus a type strain. 
and then the squares show you which species of pathogens each isolate inhibited. So here uh, you have a bacterium, an isolate that is closely related uh, to uh, a, a Pseudomonas uh, destiny, and that one uh, actually inhibited uh, Yersinia, Yersinia ruckery and Flavobacterium sacrophyllum. Okay, and so this way we can kind of uh, depict how many different bacteria we culture and how diverse the microbial community is that they came from. And I'm going to zoom out now to show you how many different types of pseudomonads we cultured and how far they're spread out over the phylogenetic tree. So here you see uh, the blue lines uh, at the outside, outermost edge. I'm going to show you how many isolates we got for each ASV. And here I'm just kind of highlighting different species that these isolates were closely related to. So we got a large diversity of pseudomonads that we could culture, and many of them uh, were actually able to inhibit the growth of at least one of these four pathogens. <clears throat> we also did something similar for flavobacteria. And you can see right here is the phylogenetic tree of the flavobacteria. And uh, the blue lines, again, uh, show you how many isolates we got uh, that ASVs that are related to the species that I'm showing you there. For example, the Flavobacterium aquali, uh, and that was also able to inhibit the growth of some bacteria. And so using uh, this uh, PacBio full-length 16S RNA-based sequencing approach, we were able to identify a very large number of bacteria in a, in a very quick way and, and get a real good insight into the composition of the microbial communities. <clears throat> and so the biofilm in aquaculture settings undergo microbial succession. This includes changes in the species composition and also an increase in diversity. And this is what one would expect from uh, biofilms in other environments as well, but this is a real com complex microbial community. And we also were able to identify bacteria that were able to inhibit the growth of other bacteria. Uh, and uh, Pseudomonas, for example, is one of them. And uh, especially Pseudomonas was then most abundant in the biofilms of the race rates with the youngest fish. And so if we can find ways, perhaps, to seed the environment with Pseudomonas or keep them uh, more abundant, we could prevent the invasion of these biofilms by more pathogenic bacteria. The full-length 16S RNA sequencing and B4 sequencing provided uh, yielded different community structures, which might be is probably due to differences in the uh, primer biases or also the cell lysis approach. The full-length 16S RNA sequencing using the PacBio was a really efficient way to identify hundreds of isolates in one big experiment. So instead of uh, doing a whole bunch of traditional uh, Sanger 16S sequencing, having to uh, align all, all of these sequences to get a consensus sequences, consequence and then identify them, we were able to do one big experiment, get full-length sequences that are highly accurate, and identify hundreds of bacteria in one big experiment. I would like to acknowledge especially uh, Todd Testament, uh, Stephanie uh, Valencia, and, <clears throat> and also Haley Donahue, uh, which is not on this slide yet, who's not on this slide yet for really working on this project. And Haley did a, a really big effort in uh, culturing these bacteria, and many members of my lab assisted in that. Also in Idaho, we had the help from Stephen Reichley and Stacy King. Uh, this is supported by the USDA, and we worked with Greg Weens and Tim Welch on this. And uh, Shoreline Biome was very helpful in, in helping us in our analysis pipeline. And Mark uh, Driscoll was important in that. And Eric Jackson uh, was instrumental in doing some of the data analysis. Thank you much, and, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions by email.